Chainers, wherever you are in the world, this is Sarah Barnes Humphrey with you today. Are you ready? Let's talk supply chain. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thoughts and Coffee. My name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I am the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain, the founder of the Blended Podcast and the Blended Pledge as well. And we're going to be talking all about that today. We're going to be talking about DEI, supply chain, the new phase of inclusion summit with the founder, Rose, who I cannot wait for you to meet. But before we do that, let's give a shout out to our sponsors. So say you're at work and all the lights flicker and then go out. You try to bump and move into something. You turn and bump into something else. You just can't work like this. You need to be able to see what's happening. Well, this is how your inventory feels. Fastenal has unique inventory solutions that sends data to the cloud and helps you avoid stockouts while not carrying excess inventory. Don't stay in the dark. Let Fastenal shine a light on the parts and supplies that keep your businesses running. Go to Fastenal.com forward slash LTSC and see how they do it. All right, let's get into what is happening at Let's Talk Supply Chain right now. We've got a brand new episode with Yifat from Osa Commerce. Now, if you haven't listened to this episode, go and check it out. Yifat's story and the journey into supply chain um, is really just incredible. I love how she thinks about business, how she thinks about supply chain, and how they are really helping to combat the supply chain chaos. I mean, everybody's kind of felt that over the last couple of years, and Osa Commerce is helping to solve for that supply chain chaos. So go and check it out wherever you listen to the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast. It's episode 354, Apple, Spotify, over on our YouTube channel, and uh, go and check that out. All right, we've also got the Supply Chain Minute. So Mike Bush um, did a Supply Chain Minute episode for us last Thursday. He does one for us everything every single Thursday morning to keep us on top of what is happening in supply chain, the state of drayage and trucking, and it's all sorts of amazing tidbits of information. So definitely go and check that out. The link is in the comments comments. And then on Friday, we've got Log Tech Live with Eric Johnson. He's going to be talking about how the internet of things is improving cargo tracking. Now we all want visibility. So I'm interested to hear how that is actually helping us. And then we've also got the blended pledge, which we'll be talking a little bit more about throughout the show. But this is our nonprofit, we give away grants to cover travel expenses, so that diverse voices can say yes to speaking engagements. Now I know we are heading into conference season. If you guys saw the Let's Talk Supply Chain Instagram story the other day, we listed out all all the places we are going to be this fall. And we want you to spread the word. If you know somebody who's been asked to speak, um, but is having challenges getting there, please go to the blendedpledge.org and apply, get them to apply because we are giving away those grants. And we've got our first corporate sponsor, which is amazing, um, who is helping us do that. And that is Bloom Global. Next, we have launched our Woman in Supply Chain monthly meeting meetup group. This is like nothing you have ever seen before. It's professionally fi facilitated. One of the facilitators is former MIT, and you are not going to want to miss this. So head over to the link, take the quiz, and we're going to be in touch because we have launched this. We are building our first group, and we'll be launching groups um, sporadically over the next couple of months, but you definitely want to be a founding member for that. And I think that's pretty much it before we bring up Rose. If you guys didn't see on my uh, LinkedIn the other day, I have been nominated for a Woman Empowerment Award in Toronto. Thanks to Audrey Ross. I'm super excited. We are going to the uh, event September 22nd in Toronto, and I guess we'll see what happens. I think they are slowly letting people know who are the finalists. So very excited about that. And shout out to Audrey. Thank you so much for thinking that I should be in that room. All right, let's bring up 
Rose. Good morning, Rose. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good. I'm so excited for you to be here. You've been on the Blended podcast before. We've talked about some hard topics. You and I really haven't even met in person. We've met <laughs> virtually. Yes. And everything that we do is kind of aligned. And so that's why the Blended pledge. We've also got Let's Talk Supply Chain sponsoring the new Face of Inclusion Summit, and I can't wait to talk about that today. So before we get into it, though, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Yes, so I'm Rose. I'm the founder of the new Face of Inclusion Summit, um, which is coming up on September 14th this year. I'm also the CEO of The Opening Door, which is a revenue operations consulting um, firm. And lastly, I'm the co-chair of the Canadian Centre of Ethics and Corporate Policy. So Ooh. those are the things that I do. Such big jobs. Yes. I yes. love it. And you're so passionate about what you do. And I can't wait to dive into that a little bit more. All right. Well, we've got lots of people joining us today. So I want to say hi to everyone. And oh, you know what? I should probably share this. So if you're seeing this, this is the post that we have for the new Face of Inclusion Summit. For you to register, we put the link into uh, the comments as well. And just to let you know, we want you to uh, take a look at the brand, make sure that you go and check out the registration page and obviously join us because we have some blended blended pledge speakers who are going to be there as well from our board and I can't wait for that. All right so let's talk about the poll of the week. So the question that we asked you what role do you see AI playing in optimizing supply chain integrations? Now Rose I not I know that you're not in supply chain and so I'm I want to come to you in just a little bit to talk about how AI is playing a role in diversity and inclusion. But first with 219 votes six 63% of you said predictive analytics, 29% of you said autonomous operations, 6% of you said quality control, and 2% of you shared your thoughts in the comments. If you didn't have a chance to be part of this poll, make sure you put your comments in the comment section of this particular show. We'll put it up on the screen. But I don't think this surprised me too much. Uh, when I'm talking about AI in supply chain, and I know there's been a lot of people wanting me to talk a lot about this, hmm. uh, predictive analytics really is one of the prominent features that AI, the role of AI is playing in supply chain. So this didn't really surprise me too, too much. What is happening with AI in diversity and inclusion? How does this sort of <laughs> correlate to what you're doing? Yeah, I would say that in DEI, AI still has not um, really taken over yet. I think we're, we're still really at the early stages as we are in, in almost all industries. But um, what I am finding is a lot of conversation around, um, you know, the, the ethics around using AI and how we can ensure that um, we're seeing diversity in AI and we're making those considerations as well. Um, we want to make sure that it's not only reflective of our, of our current world, but also where we're trying to go. And so that's where I'm seeing, you know, discussions around AI and, and DEI, just making sure that, um, you know, the data sets that we're using um, are, are, are not, um, you know, biased or um, we're just taking those considerations in, in, into, into account when we're, um, you know, using AI and building new tools and implementing it into our processes. Yeah. What makes you excited about AI in diversity and inclusion? Like what are going to be the benefits that we're really going to be able to see uh, the role of AI playing in diversity and inclusion? Because I know, you know, a lot of organizations, we talk about diversity and inclusion. We're going to talk about this a little bit later in the show as well. But mm -hmm. they struggle with, you know, what do we do? What tools? Where do we invest? All that kind of thing. So talk mm -hmm. to me about the future of AI and diversity and inclusion. What sort of gets you excited? Yeah, I think what gets me excited is um, data, because that's what we need to use AI. That's what we use to train AI. Um, the more and more that we start to capture and report on um, data as it relates to DEI, the more that we can um, know, you know, where the, the gaps are, where we need to fill the gaps. Um, what's also exciting about AI is that um, it's pushing us towards a kind of a super intelligence, a collective intelligence where um, you know, we are 
sharing what we know and we're keeping it in these, you know, knowledge bases and language models. And eventually when, you know, all of our AIs have access to that information, it kind of creates this super intelligence or this general intelligence. I think you've heard about AGI. And so um, the more that we share information, I hope that that enables more collaboration, more understanding. Um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, locally or, or, you know, within a country, I'm talking about across the entire world. So that makes me really excited that there comes a time that we can really share ideas um, and be kind of aligned collectively through the use of, of, of AI um, and, you know, some, some of that intelligence that we're, we're putting yeah. together. Yeah. Well, and the data too, like you said, the data is really important for us to be able to make decisions and move forward yes. and figure out what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I want to say hi to Melanie, Michelle, Darren, and Larry over on my personal LinkedIn. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, before we get into the articles for today, and yes, one of them is about Barbie, um, let's get to a market update. Now, Rose, I know you do a lot of work in DEI. Um, talk to us about what your clients are talking to you about. What questions do they have? You know, what are what are some of the conversations that you're having with your clients around diversity and inclusion when it comes to organizations, business, supply chain? Yeah, for sure. What I'm hearing and seeing is a little bit of a um, a pause, a little bit of a um, you know even rollback in some of the some of the progress that we've made over the last you know, 12 months, 14, 16 months. Um, and so there's, there's some concern, there's some, you know, discomfort around that. Um, and I think what we can call this may be going into a little bit of a winter, but it's not to say that, you know, DEI goes away entirely, those underlying those fundamental um, issues and, and things that we're trying to address remain. I think what I'm starting to see is that people are really kind of um, rolling it into ESG and incorporate into their ESG strategy, which I think makes perfect sense and, and works super well um, in terms of being able to allocate resources, being able to you know get the buy-in that you need. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm seeing right now. A little bit of a a little bit of a shift. We're reorganizing. I think we're you know regrouping in terms of how we're going to approach DEI and how it's going to um, be integrated into the business as a strategy from the top, not just you know one department that's isolated down underneath HR. Um, so that's what I'm starting to see some of those changes and really starting to focus on ESG as well. Yeah. And I think what that means is we need to get a little bit louder. We need some <laughs> DEI champions. We need people to be talking about it within those organizations and being very vocal about how important it is to them as an individual mm -hmm. um, so that we can keep it top of mind. We can keep those initiatives going. Right. 100%. All right. Awesome. Well, I think, you know, I think we do need to keep the conversation going. That's why we're talking about it today. Um, and I like the fact that you let us know sort of where we're at. You know, things mm -hmm. are kind of cooling. People are people are reorganizing, but it's still very top of mind for a lot of people. So if we're talking to leaders in some of those large organizations, this should still be something that's top of mind for everybody because the people that work in your organizations, it's very top of mind for them right now. And it's a big topic of conversation. I don't know about you, but this is something Thing that I have conversations about all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think it's 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 top of mind. I think you know um, since we've started to really focus on DEI, that momentum you know cannot be completely you know extinguished. And so it's just kind of you know um, having some conversations, like you said, you know com having conversations daily with with other people who care about um, okay. DEI and, and the importance of it. And just trying to find new ways to incorporate it into into the business and to um, into work. Yeah, and use the blended podcast um, as a great resource. I mean, I'm a little bit biased, <laughs> but um, use the blended podcast. I've had a lot of people say that they've used it with their teams. They've had their teams listen to it, and then they've talked about it afterwards because I bring five people from different walks of life together to talk about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So you get tons mm -hmm. of different perspectives. You know, I ask some of the hard questions. We have some really hard conversations. Um, but it's interesting to see where everybody comes from and what those points are. And everybody who participates learns something at the end of <laughs> at the yeah. end of the, the episode, just like I do. And so I think it could be a very good resource if you're looking for something. 
Absolutely. It's a win-win. And, and also we obviously have the summit coming up, the new face of inclusion summit 2023 on September 14th. It's all about inclusive leadership. Um, it's all about inclusion, how to upskill yourself, become a better leader. Um, you know, how to create um, a, a culture of psychological safety and belonging in your workplace so that everybody can thrive and, um, you know, people can perform their best. And so that's another resource. If you are available, um, you know, it's accessible online, it's virtual. And so that could be a great resource for you and your team to um, join the summit and, and learn some great things and bring yeah, it back to your work. Wait. I can't wait. All right, <laughs> let's get to our first article. Now we can't talk about diversity and inclusion without Barbie. I mean, I feel like it's sparked so many different conversations in diversity and inclusion. Now this particular um, article talks about the Barbie's creator was a supply chain innovator too, which I completely love. And the reason why um, Adrian talks about this in this particular blog, and let me know in the comments if you've seen the movie. I have not seen the movie yet, but let me know. What he talks about is the co-founder and Barbie creator, Ruth Handler. Back in 1955, she was not getting real-time sales data. And so there was a really big lag, I think of like six weeks from uh, the information going to the manufacturer. And so the product wasn't being created in real time. And so she actually sent a troop of people out to the different stores on a daily basis to find out what was happening with her product so that she could have real time data. She also climbed behind the wheel of her delivery trucks and she understood the bullwhip bull effect in 1955. We still have a long way to go in supply chain because when it comes to data, we still need to create trust and um, that's going to help us be able to share data. But I thought this was a really great way for us to take a look back and see how real-time visibility and data was so important back in 1955. Now, Rose, I'm going to bring you into the conversation around Barbie because it sparked so many conversations about diversity and inclusion. Yes. What are some of the things that um, you've liked seeing or some of the conversations that you're seeing that are that are positive coming out of this whole Barbie wave? Yes, yes. Um, it's so great, especially as somebody who, you know, Barbie was at the peak of my time. It's so exciting. Um, what I'm hearing is a lot of conversations around around gender, actually. Um, you know, taking a look at the way that Ken and the men in that Barbie world in that movie were, um, you know, the way that they were shared, the way that their their characters were developed, and um, just taking a look at, you know, how the Barbie world almost represents or or um, looks like the opposite of our world, right? Where, you know, traditionally in, in the Barbie world, women are in charge and, you know, um, they make the decisions and, and that sort of thing. And so that kind of, it, it, it's, it's interesting and it, and it provokes a lot of, of discussion and thinking about, okay, you know, um, was, is it fully satire or is this kind of, you know, um, an inkling to us that there's something we should look at the way that our world is set up and 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 how there it's still quite unequal in a lot of ways when it comes to gender. So those are some of the discussions that have come up, which is really interesting. I think some of the other discussions were about, you know, um, just the different the the variety of jobs that Barbie has had and and the different representations of her and the different representations yeah. of women. It's just like, wow, you know, Barbie really can be and do anything and everything, which I think is such a great um, message mm -hmm. yeah. and inspiration yes. and I think it was there was a, an America uh, is it America Ferreira her like oh yes, yes so I haven't watched the movie so I don't I don't know but I've seen quite a few posts about the monologue that she had yeah. and I read that monologue and I was like wow like yeah. those are all the things that go through my head and she just put that on, on we just put that on paper absolutely and now it's out there for the world to really understand yes. how we think about things mm -hmm. um as women or how we think about things as you know an underrepresented community whatever that mm -hmm. looks like and i know mm -hmm. that was geared more towards uh women yes. but it takes me back so we actually have a blended episode coming out about what women have to think about for 
versus men. Mm. Um, I don't know when it's coming out. I think it might come out next month or something like that. And we had a really great, robust panel discussion talking about this and what we have to think about in the morning and things like that. And so this particular monologue um, was very, very timely. Yes. And I think you're going to hear a lot more and expand on that a lot more mm. with the blended episode coming up. But um, that was really interesting because I read yes. it and it's resonated with, with, with me so much. Yes. It did for me as well. I know there were some in the in the audience that I thought, you know, younger, young, young younger uh, folks, and I thought, there's no way you're picking up on any of this. It really is for um, <laughs> the adults <laughs> who know how the world works and and can pick up on the innuendos and the and the, um, the cool jokes in there. All right. So let's get to our next article. So now I want to point out some of the stats that came through this particular article. So 21% of organizations had no DEI focus in 2021. 21% is still a lot. And in 2022, it went down to 11%. So mm -hmm. we're doing better, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, but only 40% of those have DEI targets. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about this. Why, like, because in this particular article, they talk about the power of diversity and inclusion within an organization, but even better still within a supply chain. Supply mm -hmm. chain is so global, right? We have so many different people, so many different perspectives, life experiences, mm -hmm. that it really just um, helps create an environment of creativity and innovation. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why they're focusing on diversity and inclusion specifically as well mm -hmm. in supply chain. But mm -hmm. talk to us about this you know why are we still only seeing about 40 percent what do we need to do to get um you know that number even higher yeah i think i think that we you know we're, we're doing great i think of course we have you know a lot more to do um in terms of increasing that number i think we need to have a, a clear idea around you know why we are uh putting a, you know a, su a supplier diversity program in place, for example. And then, you know, what you said about missing data, I think it's really important that we're always considering data. We're always looking to measure, we're always looking to capture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's a really important piece. And so if a company has not yet come around to understanding the importance of data, the importance of clean, uh, timely data um, that's up to date, then that's you know, that's going to be the barrier to to them um, being able to really uh, benefit from supplier diversity and implement uh, a really great supplier diversity program. So um, I think it's a little bit about technology adoption, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, data ad adoption and, and some of those processes kind of have to be in place and that that culture has to be established before you can really um, benefit from from all the great things that, you know, diversity in supply chain brings. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, jumping in on that around supplier diversity, if you're going to work with smaller underrepresented suppliers, um, also some of the process needs to change mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. right? Legal documentation, a smaller underrepresented um, business doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have the access to legal or has the money to pay legal to be able mm -hmm. to go through something like that. Mm -hmm. We need to make it a lot simpler. But what they also talked about in this article is organizations need to reduce dependence on small group of suppliers. We need to mm. increase yes. what that looks like, right? Yeah. In, in the face of disruption, I mean, if we take the pandemic, mm -hmm. those that had a robust supplier network, um, a diverse supplier network really mm -hmm. weathered the storm a lot better than those who didn't. And so if we're thinking yeah. about the future, we're thinking about the future of the business and what we want that to look like, it really makes good business sense. But one mm -hmm. of the things that they talk talked about in this article too is organizations struggle to determine which DEI initiatives to invest in. What would you say to an organization that is just sort of struggling to try to figure out, yes, I want to do good. Yes, I want to make an impact. Yes, I want to figure this out, but I'm just not entirely sure what to invest in and where to start. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, that's a great question. I think the first thing, and I'm a data-driven person, so I'm always going to bring up data. I would say speak to um, your employees, speak to, you know, those who you're trying to serve and, and develop these programs for. What's important to them? What do they care about? Who is in your org? You know, wh what representation do you already have that you might want to dial into 
and, you know, um, approach first, even, um, you know, you can have great diversity on, you know, one level, but if you bring it down, you know, two or three levels, you might start to see some, some areas or some opportunities. So I would always say, if you're not sure where to invest or how to go about it, speak to, you know, go internal first, speak to the people internally, your employees, your current suppliers, get a lay of the land, see where things are at, um, what you currently have, and then kind of plan from there. Well, yeah. And I think part of it is investing in your people, Mm -hmm. um, right? Investing in what is important to them as well. One of the, one of the examples that we can give is obviously the blended pledge, um, donating, supporting, sponsoring Mm -hmm. things like that, where we're actually seeing a visible change because we're, you know, supporting diverse voices to speak on industry stages. And we're going to get to conferences in a minute, Mm -hmm. supporting, sponsoring conferences like the new face of inclusion summit, Mm -hmm. sending your people to a conference like this, because you're going to be talking about leadership, Mm -hmm. right? I think we need more training into what that looks like and Mm -hmm. how we can start internally to have those safe spaces, have those conversations. Um, And then we've also like, we've just launched the secret society of supply chain. We have a monthly Mm -hmm. meetup for women in supply chain so they can get together on a monthly basis, you know, and yeah. speak their truth and have yeah. a safe space to talk to each other and like-minded individuals. And I'm going through this. Oh, you know what? I've been through that. This is what yeah. that looks like. I empathize with you, that kind of thing. And these kinds of initiatives, they're all out there, yeah. but you just need to take a moment to do some research and, and see what you can invest in, how you can invest in your people. Now, before we go to our last article, I just want to say hi to Claire Deo. We've also got uh, Sibtian and we've got Tamia over on my personal LinkedIn. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Well, last but not least, because we've only got a couple of minutes on this one, we want to talk about improving diversity at conferences. Now, 69% of the speaker pool is male, according to this particular article. So it doesn't surprise us that we do see a lot of men on industry stages. But what they also talk about in this article is that the most confident and the most engaging is not necessarily the best people to be up on stage. We want the people in the audience to be able to resonate, Mm -hmm. right, with those who are on the stage. We want to have different perspectives and experiences because that's what brings richer conversations, right? That's what engages the audience. And it actually encourages greater attendance. So if you are a conference organizer, and you're thinking about how do I increase my attendance to my conference? It's about finding more diversity for industry stages. And that's not just gender. Um, You know, no more fancy titles being the the linchpin of like, Mm -hmm. how who we put on stage. Right. We want to hear from people on the front lines. We want to hear from people who have the experience and have been in the industry for a while. What do you think about this, Rose? I, I agree entirely. Um, I definitely am, you know, tired of, of the same voices, um, you know, and, and seeing the same faces when we know that it's not a pipeline problem because, you know, there are folks with all the expertise and all the knowledge, um, you know, that can um, uh, you know, improve that, um, diversity and, and that representation. And so that's why it was so exciting. And it was a no brainer to partner with the, the blended pledge for our summit, because that's exactly what you, what you all focus on is bringing diverse first voices, which I think is so important. I'm certainly at a point where if I see a panel or a conference where everybody looks the same, it's homogenous, I, I won't support. I, that's how I am, you know, using my small purchasing power to, to influence, you know, the changes that we want to see when it comes to, you know, things like the speakers at conferences. It's a good point. And this particular article actually talks about and breaks down what you can do to really help. And some of those are um, asking for speaker recommendations within a diverse slate of people. Mm -hmm. Um, Pay your speakers is another one, right? Or at least pay Mm -hmm. for travel expenses, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, Um, pass the baton. If you get asked to speak and, you know, you can pass the baton to somebody else who will smash it on stage, you know, do so, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And don't always have a person of color speaking about diversity and inclusion. 
right? Yeah. I think for me, one of the examples that I want to give is um, there is an industry conference that I don't participate in anymore. And one of the reasons is they pit women against each other in a popularity mm. contest. Mm. We get away from that. Yeah. Those are the kind of things that we, if we are going to be doing these, these things and making an impact on the industry, let's not pity each other against each other to win an award. Right. Let's, you know, bring everybody together and figure out how we can make that even like so that it's not so detrimental to somebody's mental health right, <laughs> right? like yeah. that anyways I know we're coming to the end and I just want to let everybody know where we're going to be so Iana Expo is happening September 11th through 13th in Long Beach California I will be there so hopefully if you're there come and say hi Inland Distribution Conference with JOC uh, September 25th to 27th in Chicago and of course we've got the New Face of Inclusion Summit happening virtually September 14th and the Woman in Supply Chain Forum in November and again we've got Eric coming up Friday morning live with log tech so thank you all so much for joining us rose you are a rock star and i cannot wait for your conference coming up in september thanks so much for joining us today